Hi. Um, just kind of thanks very much to Barry. I think he uh, made me sound like a really nasty person in that, actually, which is great. It's a, a reputation, reputation I'm quite proud of, actually. Um, <laughs> OK, so, yeah, I'm here to say that I think officers should be abolished. Um, it's really nice to see so many teachers here in the room today, um, you know, people giving up their Saturdays to come and talk about education. Um, I think it proves something that I've believed for a long time, which is that I absolutely love teaching. I think it's the best job in the world. I don't think there's another job that I'd ever want to spend my time doing. Um, it's something that my dad keeps saying to me, are you not over that silly teaching phase yet? <laughs> you know, I've been doing it for five years now, and no, I'm pretty addicted to it. I don't want to give it up. I really love it. I think it's the best job in the world, and, and I assume that lots of you here think that too. So I first started teaching in 2011 in a school that was in special measures uh, in the West Midlands, and that had its challenges, for sure. And I loved teaching right from the beginning. I absolutely loved it. I love the kids, I love my subjects, I really liked my colleagues, there was so much I could learn from them, there were some great people in my department, my head of department was great, my mentors were brilliant. I was really fortunate in lots and lots and lots of ways. But there was one thing about the job that took the edge off somewhat, <laughs> that made it unpleasant, that made it worse, that made it less likely that I wanted to go into work in the morning, and that was, you've guessed it, the big O, Ofsted. Um, because, we had, because we were in special measures, um, we basically had a revolving door on the front of the school that allowed inspectors in and out. I mean, we didn't even bother changing the parking space's name because they were in so often. Um, so that made it, that meant that I was observed many, many times um, in the first few months of my career by officer inspectors. Um, so the first time I was observed was when I was teaching my top set year nine class. Um, we were reading Oliver Twist and we were reading it out loud. They were a top set class, challenging book, but we still were reading it aloud because you know, it's quite important if you're going to study a book that you should probably read it. Um, so we did that. But I was told that that lesson was inadequate because reading aloud is apparently not challenging. And reading aloud is not, uh, it's, it's not an off variety. It's boring. It's not engaging. Even though I think that characters of Fagin and Bill Sykes are two of the most exciting and engaging characters ever to have been written about. And I think that there's no, no, no harm in, in hearing, to them, um, hearing them spoken out loud. Um, so I was told that that was inadequate. And that meant that from that point on, in every single lesson I taught, my SLT told me that I wasn't allowed to read aloud with children. That actually, instead of reading aloud, I should do what a teacher down the corridor who got an outstanding in their observation did, which was to stick in personalised learning objectives into every single child's book at the beginning of the lesson. So, you know, that took about 10 minutes at the beginning of every lesson, kids kind of frantically trying to glue these things. things and, well, actually, I mean, I use the, the word frantically. There was no franticness about it. They were pretty sluggish, if I'm honest. Um, so it took about 10 minutes out of every single lesson um, and then um, I was I was told that that was best practice and obviously that's not even including the time that I spent typing them up at home and then the time that it took for me to cut them up and it was just a complete nightmare and these kind of examples of, of what I thought was fairly arbitrary um, examples of outstanding practice um, became well, they really prol proliferated throughout the school and the whole teaching and learning policy was structured and framed and shaped around what the officer inspectors had asked for in the previous inspection and Yes, there may be the fact that some inspectors out there are rogue inspectors, but if the, uh, the, if the plural of anecdote is anecdata, then I'm sure that actually there are lots of teachers that I've spoken to who would, would agree that actually whatever an officer inspector says in their, their visit becomes the teaching and learning norms of the school uh, months later. Of course, until the next offset inspection, which when you're in special measures happens quite often, um, and then the new targets would come in. So, the first round of offset inspections meant we had to have objectives stuck into our book and no teacher talk, all group work in every single lesson. And then the next time Ofsted came back, we had to have um, a word wall and we had to have examples of pupil work on the walls. And that was something that, of course, teachers spent hours doing. <sighs> there was also a teacher in my school, in my department, who was also given an inadequate grading when he was um, seen by Ofsted. He was one of the best English teachers I'd ever seen. He was absolutely fantastic. He knew his subject inside out. He loved the kids. He really loved talking about his subject. He knew more about Shakespeare than I think I could ever learn in a lifetime. And I really admired him and I thought he was excellent. Um, also just a really lovely guy. He was given an inadequate grading for talking in the lesson, because um, talking is, should be forbidden if you're a teacher, apparently. Um, and he ended up going off work five months later with depression. And I, he never came back to the classroom. And again, that's not an isolated incident. That's something that happens often. That's the kind of story that I hear all the time. And um, it makes me really sad because, like I say, I love teaching. Most teachers in the profession really love teaching. And they really, they, 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 they value the job. And I actually think most teachers are really good and actually really love the kids. Regardless of whether you're a traditionalist or progressive, 
Um, I really admire teachers who really love their job and who, who love what they do. There are t tweeters in this room, I know, who are teachers who would profoundly disagree with the practices that we carry out here at Michaela and whom I might disagree with as well. But actually, I still really value what they're saying. But the problem is Ofsted destroys that. It takes away that trust and that professionalism. It means that we have to stay up all night working really hard, creating new resources that please an offset inspector and subsequently please an SLT member who's looking for that thing when he comes into your room with a clipboard. For example, once I was told that my lesson was inadequate because I started my lesson with the word, um, hi guys, today we're gonna learn about, no, today, today we're gonna do Frankenstein. And I was given inadequate because I should have said, Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to start. Today we're going to learn about Frankenstein because I hadn't said we were going to learn about Frankenstein. That made me inadequate as a teacher, and that made me feel really bad about my teaching. It made me feel like a bad person. It made me feel like I wasn't in, I wasn't adequate and that I wasn't doing the right thing. So it destroys how teachers feel about teaching. It destroys how they feel about their subjects. Um, it makes teaching worse. In a nutshell, Ofsted make teaching worse. It makes you. It, it forces you to use the kind of techniques that an inspector tells you to use, which are enforced on you, which you may not agree with, and um, it forces you to to think badly about your practice. But I want to go further in this speech. It's not just that it makes teachers feel bad about their jobs. It's also Ofsted makes senior leaders bad at their jobs. It makes them bad at their jobs. How does it make them bad at their jobs? Well. Before I, when I was working in my old school, I didn't really have an idea, any idea of what went on under the bonnet, what teachers actually did, uh, what was actually going on in the school beyond teachers being observed when Ofsted came to visit. I now know, now that I've moved to Michaela, and now that I'm a more senior member of staff, um, that there's a lot of preparation that has to happen. And we do the bare minimum here because, you know, you can probably gather, we're not pro Ofsted really. Um, we're quite happy to, to not do all of the things that Ofsted are gonna tell us to, to do. Um, but lots of schools aren't less brave. And I don't blame them for being less brave, actually. They are, it's very high stakes. Head teachers don't want to lose their jobs. Why should they risk losing their jobs? So they do what Ofsted demands, and that is often a lot of paperwork. Take, for example, a classic CEF. We don't yet have a CEF at Michaela. <laughs> we'll put one together when Ofsted arrive, but it's not something that we're gonna spend the next year and a half worrying about, because why should we? Um, that would mean that we're not focusing on the children, which are the most important thing at the end of the day. Um, so I did a bit of research in anticipation of this event and I looked up a few CEFs and I found that um, there were, in a couple of schools in Brent in the local area, I just picked out, you know, a local authority school, a primary school, um, an academy, and they all had a few things in common. They were incredibly long. They were incredibly long. One of them, I think, was 33 pages. And I think on Twitter previously, I had sort of hyperbolically suggested, oh, who needs an 18-page CEF? I hadn't realized that actually I was about only 50% of the way there, when actually most CEFs are much longer than that. Um, and then I looked at the content of the CEFs, and I thought, well, what is it that's actually in these CEFs? What is it that, that requires all of this paperwork? And crikey, that must have taken a long time for some poor senior leader in their <laughs> office to write. Um, so there were five columns to it, sorry. Um, one of them is, um, this is the general Ofsted area. This is the, the second one was, these are specific Ofsted requirements. The third one is what grade they think they are for that. And the fourth one is um, why they think they're that grade. And the fifth one is the evidence for that grade. I mean, <laughs> there was a lot of information. There was a lot of bullet points. There was a lot typed up. And I did wonder, who actually reads this? Who actually reads this, Seth, other than the inspector who will come around and look at it? And if nobody reads it apart from the inspector, what is the point in writing it in the first place? It's not actually helping the school to improve. But let's go into more detail. Let's have a little bit of a look at the kinds of things that are on there. So in one box about cultural and social development of the, of the pupils, um, things included, we must make sure that children have access to a range of literature, that they, have range, uh, they, they learn about different cultures, um, that their spiritual development is encouraged, their moral development is encouraged, all those types of things. And then they put in, they said we were outstanding for this, and they put in various different examples saying, well, it's because um, we do this, that, and the other. Is that five? One minute. One minute. Oh, crikey. Um, you know, we, we do all of these different things, um, and these are, these are the pieces of evidence. And one of the pieces of evidence uh, given was their RE curriculum. I mean, surely it's a given that the RE curriculum will give children access to a range of different spiritual uh, spiritualities and, 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 and some knowledge of culture and morality. It seems utterly ludicrous that we need to write that down. The point I'm making is that every single minute that a senior leader spends writing that down and thinking really carefully about what to put in that CEF so they can appease an Ofsted inspector who they don't yet know and who they're trying to second guess for the entire three years before Ofsted come, um, means that they're not actually spending that time with the kids. They could be out in the yard making sure that kids are, are behaving sensibly. They could be st standing outside the toilets making sure that nobody's getting bullied. They could be having a conversation with a parent. They could be having a conversation with a child on a one-to-one -one basis. They could be enhancing their subject knowledge. And instead, they're sitting in an office writing all of these things down. 
for Ofsted to come in for two days every three years, read through this paperwork, make a fairly arbitrary judgment that no one believes anyway. And um, basically it means that they lose sight of what really matters, the pupils. So that's it. Thanks. Hello. Um, I like musical theatre. Bear with me on this one. Um, and I was recently involved uh, in a Twitter discussion uh, that was both uh, enjoyable and entertaining, which is rare enough in these dark days, um, in which uh, a number of us were considering how to apply the lyrics of the, the great West End uh, staple Les Miserables to the experience of being a teacher. Uh, Javert as an Ofsted inspector, perhaps Cosette as a, as a poor girl uh, needing assistance. Um, and a particular lyric from uh, Les Miserables, uh, sung by uh, one of the National Guardsmen as Enjolras and the, uh, the, the students uh, on their dune barricade in the Rue de Villette. The National Guardsman uh, tells them that Paris has not risen for them. There will be no people to assist them in their defence of their barricade. And he sings to them, you have no chance, no chance at all. And that sort of came round my head a lot while I tried to think about how I was going to persuade a room full of teachers that Ofsted was a good idea. Um, but I am going to rest, I am going to try and do it, and we'll see how we go. I'm going to rest my uh, defence on, on three pillars. The first is on the necessity of accountability, uh, including with that, uh, within that inspection. Uh, the second is that um, Ofsted is not primarily designed uh, for uh, the, the sort of, for teachers in that sense. It has another wider purpose, um, and that therefore our objections to it are not necessarily reasons for it to go. Uh, and the third is recent evidence of its adaptability to legitimately raised uh, questions. To argue that accountability is uh, essential, I think, is not necessarily very controversial. Education in this country, state education, is expensive. Um, it costs around £42 billion pounds per annum, um, plus some additional capital costs. Um, and, of course, it's important. I don't need to tell a room full of teachers who've given up their Saturday uh, why education is important, even if amongst us we might have a diverse uh, range of views of in which ways and, and how it is important. Because it is important, I think it's legitimate that we are held accountable for what it is we do. Um, it is worth bearing in mind that, as you say, we, we spend a vast amount of public money. Um, and schools are also uh, one of three places to which people can be sent against their will, uh, other than prisons and asylums for the mentally insane. Um, so when we have these children uh, that have been told to come to us, uh, and we have this money that we've been given, I think we should account for it. And what does accountability mean in that sense? Um, and I think there are three forms. The first is financial, uh, by which we are accountable through the audit function. Um, outcomes, um, by which we are accountable through league tables or through destination data. I imagine there's a debate to be had about precisely how we want to balance those, but, but what it is that we produce at the end of it. But I would also ar argue we are accountable for our day-to-day -day practice, and that is where I think Ofsted and inspection has a role. Why would I argue practice is useful? Bearing in mind that if we're spending money appropriately within the law and we are uh, producing the outcomes that the, go the government have indicated they want, why do we need to be assessed on our practice? I think the the way to win that argument became slightly easier in the last four months with the collapse of kids' company. Education, anything to do with children, um, uh, is surrounded by a kind of emotional um, wall. It is so important, we should value what the children are doing, um, that it's very easy, I think, for practice to become um, elided or to become hidden under a, a, you know, sort of that great Twitter meme of, you know, won't somebody think of the children? Um, and I think that's precisely what happened to kids' company, a place in which um, it's true they were also not meeting their audit function or their outcomes but particularly their practice um, was suspect, um, was not challenged, was not inspected, they did not fall within an offset framework and they were not examined on that. Uh, and I think that created problems both in terms of how they spent the money but also problems for those people who were involved in that organisation who were not challenged appropriately um, and who therefore now are tainted with um, that failure. But I also think we need to be uh, examining our practice because of the existence of gaming. Um, we all know what gaming is, we know that there are various ways in which you can game the outcomes or you can game um, the things that we're being asked to do, um, sort of uh, high tariff, low challenge courses or coursework manipulation and so on and so forth. Um, some of those things will go under the new frameworks the government has imposed, but there will always be a way um, and people will always seek to find ways to um, meet the obligations laid on schools in ways that are not, um, not fulfilling the requirements, not in the way that we would want them to do so. And I think we need to be uh, inspected for that purpose. So I think Inspection in that sense can help teachers, it can help us as a defence against poor practice or poor ways of implementing or, or fulfilling the demands laid upon us. But I also think it's important to make clear that it's not primarily designed for us. 
Ofsted uh, exists in, in a, a world in which teachers often ask for trust. We, we, we ask to be trusted, but trust is not unconditional. Trust depends upon uh, openness and it depends upon a reciprocal relationship. And who are we asking to trust us? We're asking the government um, whose money we spend and we're asking the parents whose teach children we educate. And I think Ofsted exists as a guarantor for the parents and for the government um, that uh, those things are happening in a legitimate and fair way, especially in an age of such um, fierce debate about education. Um, I think it is also important for us as teachers to know what is happening in other schools, what practice are they using, how are they achieving those outcomes that we might want to replicate, are those things that we want to do. And of course there are other ways of building that trust other than an inspectorate um, and other systems use different ways, state approved textbooks or far greater control over initial teacher training. Or, or other systems. However, as Laura McInerney is uh, so keen to point out to us so frequently, uh, education had an inspectorate in England long before it had a ministry. Inspection is built within the system and within the framework, and I think it's far easier to see the English accepting the continuation of, of inspection than it is to see them expect, uh, accepting state-approved textbooks um, or even um, much, much tighter control on ITT. We have a much more diffused ITT system. And so I think in that light, that the, it is essential that teachers understand that though they may not like it, Ofsted exists in order to build trust between them and between those people for whom they work, and it, for that reason it should exist. That notwithstanding, it's not the case, I think, that Ofsted is completely unresponsive to legitimate challenges laid against it. Had you gathered together a room full of teachers three years ago and asked them to write down uh, the things they wanted Ofsted to change short of um, full abolition, they would have listed the abolition of lesson observation, or graded lesson observations, uh, the removal of outsourced inspections, um, a more uh, robust quality assurance framework, shorter inspections, and a commitment to having no preferred learning styles. Uh, those are all things that the new framework guarantees. Now clearly, those things may not happen. They may not be done by everybody, and Ofsted for those things must also be held accountable. But it's not the case, I think, that Ofsted has shown that it's not willing to respond to those uh, claims that are laid against it. So I think for those reasons, accountability is an essential feature of the education system, and inspection is an appropriate and viable part of that accountability framework. That teacher dislike of Ofsted um, is not a prima facie reason to remove it. Indeed, it may actually be a relatively good argument for its maintenance. And finally, uh, and notwithstanding that, that Ofsted has made clear that where it is um, uh, fulfilling its, uh, where it is in keeping with its mission, it will make appropriate adaptations to its practice. I think Ofsted is a valuable and vital part of our education system, and I urge that we should keep it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Katie and John. Uh, now Katie is going to address some of the points that John raised. Thank you very much. Okay, right, I feel like I'm getting the swing of it now. I was a bit nervous before, but um, thanks, John. I think there were some really interesting points there. Um, on the point of accountability, I would like to argue that Ofsted don't keep schools to account. <laughs> so, we, yes, we may need some accountability into the system, but in its current form, Ofsted does not hold schools to account. What they do is they come in for two days every three years, and they look at paperwork that people have tried to gain. John's challenge was that, actually, we need to stop people from gaming the system. Ofsted's existence makes people game the system. They game Ofsted. That's the massive problem with Ofsted, is that you try, you try and second-guess an inspector. That's what we spend three years in the run-up to an inspection trying to do. So I don't think that accountability is a fair enough challenge to, a reason to keep Ofsted open. For example, on safeguarding, so I'm the de designated safeguarding lead at, the, at Michaela. <clears throat> I would argue that our kids are very safe here. Every single... Um, teacher knows about the relevant issues, um, we know about the relative procedures for reporting things, um, for making sure that things, um, we, we communicate well with parents, that we communicate properly with children, that children have their views heard, that we get in touch with the local authority at the right appropriate time, that we deal with things in the appropriate way. Um, the fact that we don't have um, the enormous list of documents um, that the that Ofsted might ask for when they come visit doesn't mean that our children aren't safe. Ofsted cannot get an accurate picture of the safety of a child in a school by coming in and looking at paperwork. It is utterly ludicrous. And if we think that that is going to enable us to keep children safe in schools, we are wrong in thinking that. That's just not what's going to happen. Um, if we think that by looking through the single central register and making sure that every single box is ticked, we're keeping children safe, we are wrong about that. Um, secondly, in terms of financial accountability, Ofsted inspectors 
barely look at finances because they're ex-head teachers who don't know anything about finances. So actually, we have an external, external auditor already who comes in and does that for us in schools. Um, so if we don't require Ofsted. Even so, why would we require a school inspector if financial um, um, accountability was what was required? Why not just have a separate body um, for financial accountability? I don't think that it's, again, an adequate response to say that um, financial accountability is necessary. Um, yes, it does harm teachers, and I do think that actually that is a reason to abolish it in itself, regardless of the impact on children. I'm arguing today that actually it makes schools worse because it makes teachers worse at their jobs, and it makes senior leaders worse at their jobs. Oh, sorry, it's too close. <laughs> um, it makes senior leaders worse at their jobs. So that means that actually um, we are not educating children as well as we could if Ofsted did not exist. Um, it doesn't hold schools to account, and it doesn't make us better at our jobs. So there would be, those would be my two um, comebacks, I suppose, to um, John. I don't think there was anything else I wanted to say. Um, actually, on the point of trust, um, I think that's an interesting point. I actually do think that the more trust you give people, the more that likely they are to flourish. I think the more freedom, the more space you give people, particularly professionals like teachers, who, as I began saying at the beginning of this speech, I think are excellent people generally, and who are incredibly good at their jobs and come into it for really noble reasons and who really care about the children. Why not trust them? They're not going to do something that's not in the best interests of children most of the time. Okay? Um, so I think we should. I think the more trust you give people, the more they flourish. Here, certainly at Michaela, Catherine trusts us enormously, and it's one of the things that makes it such a pleasure to work here because Catherine gives us a space to to have our own innovation and creativity and do what we want to do, and and make the school as great as we possibly can. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I think uh, on the finance point, my argument wasn't that uh, finance is obviously uh, inspected by the audits, and I think that's fine, but I think it's, it's about making sure that we've got a comparative level for, for the, the actual teaching practice in the school. Um, I think um, part of the point about accountability, and yes, it is certainly possible to game uh, Ofsted as it is possible to game any accountable system, but it's the mixed constitution of accountability forms um, which prevent gaming. So just as Progress 8 um, combined with um, uh, APS percentage will make it harder to locate students in um, different or inappropriate um, groups of qualifications uh, in order to avoid them getting, you know, crap junk qualifications. Um, I think there is the, the, the value of that mixed constitution of accountability is precisely because it balances out across the whole um, piece. Um, I think on the notion of trust, I think uh, there, there we have a fundamental disagreement. I think um, there are lots of reasons to trust people on a day-to-day -day basis in uh, schools provided you have eventual forms of accountability but if you don't have that then actually i think kids company is precisely an example of what will happen where trust is invested and no accountability um, is maintained i think on the process by which ofsted um, completes it yes it's two days um, every three years perhaps we talk about whether it should come more often but I would point out that most of the people including myself in this room would be quite happy for children to be judged on one three-hour exam after two years of work why would not something similar apply uh, to Ofsted and to schools the final point Ofsted makes us bad at our jobs Ofsted didn't create bad management in teaching the fads the lack of project management, the, the poor planning, heads demanding ridiculous pieces of paper, or all those sort of things. It's, it, you know, Ofsted doesn't create those things. Ofsted is, in this sense, and to return uh, to another uh, musical uh, that I greatly enjoy, Return to the Forbidden Planet, uh, based on the, the, the film that was itself based on The Tempest, in which um, the deranged scientist, Dr. Prospero, um, takes a drug that, from his id, creates terrible monsters. Um, if we are monstered by terrible things in the profession because of Ofsted, I would argue that it is only the id of the teaching profession, a profession that is not good enough at managing itself, not good enough at policing uh, its own behaviour, not good enough at defending proper teacher practice, not good enough at understanding the research about teaching uh, and learning. So uh, to conclude with a perhaps slightly more highbrow uh, paraphrase, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in the inspectorate, it is in ourselves. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have time for plenty of questions. I think. Okay, sorry, let me. Lost in a, a world where I got to be in Les Mis there. It's very, it's very sad. I've been pulled back into reality. Um, okay, I think. Um, I mean, first of all, to say uh, to the gentleman over there is. Um, 
I am still uh, an active member of the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, so I'm getting used to living under Soviet-style bureaucracy. Um, uh, you know, wait, waiting for my purge. Um, I think. I think in the first place, I think it is, it is in incumbent on us to recognise the extent to which Ofsted has reformed over the past two years. And I think it is unfair to demand their abolition in regards to that. So, yes, I think there, um, there is some responsibility for the, the creation of massive amounts of paperwork. But equally, Ofsted have taken significant pains uh, over the recent period to make clear that that paperwork is not what they have asked for and not what they want to see and not what they need. Um, and I think they should be, uh, that should at least be trialled in the new uh, Ofsted framework they've done. And the same thing, I think, for um, uh, sort of sharing responsibility for, for having generated um, poor Ofsted um, grade or, or high Ofsted gradings for schools that were actually poor. I think there have been processes put in place to attempt to uh, amend that, and I think they should be given the chance uh, to at least be tested. I think. Daisy raises a number of points about those people who are genuinely concerned about Ofsted and others say that, yes, they are happy with a regulatory model, but they're not happy with um, Ofsted, I think it's Ofsted in particular. But then I think the question there is, well, how different would an alternative regulator be? Is changing the name just enough? I think, uh, you know, I entirely agree with the point made that actually a lot of these problems are manifestations of issues within the teaching profession. I think if we don't correct those, then any inspection framework that we create will generate these kind of poor outcomes. Because if we don't make training for management, and middle management in particular, better, I think it will always be the case that people will take what they are given um, from Ofsted and, and um, pervert it in ways that are not helpful um, until we have that greater confidence and that greater skills base to, to do it uh, and use it appropriately. Um, and I think it's I wouldn't take ISI as an alternative model, I think partly because the private sector and the state sector operate in entirely different ways. If you pay a vast amount of money for your children's education, there is a different relationship. It's not to say that all parents who pay money take the same interest in their children's schooling, or that children who, or parents who don't pay money don't take an interest in their schooling. But I think the, the incentives to be involved are different. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we must guard against in education, um, and that I think the government through the mechanisms that it uses, including Ofsted as a bulwark against, is taking um, only the most voluble of parents as representative of all parents. Um, it's not the case. I think that's how you end up with um, comprehensive schools that junk um, academic curricula because it sounds uh, sexy and exciting to middle class parents who are delivering that kind of material at home while their working class peers are denied access to powerful education. And I think that is a, it's, it's essential um, that government uh, maintain that role and it have the information necessary to make those choices and make those decisions. And I think, um, yes, I, I would agree that an Ofsted as it was four years ago needed reform. I think that reform has happened. I think we should see how that works. I think we should consistently maintain the iterative process of feedback, but I do not think we can survive, and nor do I think we should try to survive without a fully functioning inspectorate. Thank you. Okay, so um, some really interesting questions there. I think there was a, a theme of, well, essentially, am I saying com abolish all inspectorates uh, of school um, completely or um, just reform Ofsted? Um, an answer to, to the point at the, at the back about would it make things better if Ofsted was shining a light on things that worked, and I think it was raised here as well by most in our governor that, you know, maybe we'd want all schools to be like Michaela. Um, I actually don't think I would want all schools to be like Michaela. Um, because actually, I think difference is what makes the world go round. I think we are all different. I think we all want different things for our kids. And not everybody wants to send their kids to Michaela. And I, I totally get that. Um, not, some people would prefer their children to go to school 21. And that's why I don't have a problem with that school existing. Because I think it's probably doing some really great things, um, even though it's very, very different to what we offer here at Michaela. Parents need to have the choice, ultimately. So no, I wouldn't want an inspectorate that ensured that every single school was the same um, as Michaela and shining the light on good things. Because I just don't think, actually, in, in, in reality, it would ever work. Um, I just think that it's also a huge monster of a machine, as Ofsted, with so many inspectors, so many schools to look at. There's no way you're ever going to get consistency. Um, and there's no way that we actually want that consistency either, um, because people are different. So that would be my point, which I think addresses a number of questions there. Um, what else have been said? Um, yeah, the interesting about um, 
ISI. I think, um, again, yeah, as John said, I agree with John that it, it, ISI operates differently because the private sector operates differently to, um, to the state sector. But in addition to that, um, I would go further and I'd actually say that any system that gives people targets are open to perverse incentives. Um, it's why I'm against performance-related pay, which I actually wasn't before I started working in Michaela. I was pro-performance-related pay, but actually I'm against it now because um, Catherine has, has persuaded me that it's a bad idea. And so I defer you to her to, to, to read out read the stuff that she's read on that. But essentially, give somebody a target and they'll meet that target. They won't go above and beyond and they won't do what's actually right and they lose sight of what matters. And I think that's the same with any kind of inspectorate that could be available to schools. Now, I'm not saying we should just allow schools to be free and do whatever they want. I, I would be worried about that, especially at the, at, the, at the moment in the education system. And as we've seen with the free school movement, you know, you, you give people freedom, it creates a bell curve. You're going to get some people that are great, some people in the middle, and some people at the bottom, and that is inevitably going to happen. But you can't actually enable that kind of, those great people, those the, the kind of most innovative people to, to, to to be created, to come about in the first place, to flourish without that freedom. So I suppose ultimately it comes down to your values. I actually do value that freedom and I do value the idea that we want to allow the best things to happen and to kind of crop up and then um, address that and, and try and um, learn from the best examples. Um, other people might not agree with that. Other people would say that in fact what we need um, is for everybody to be the same, even if that wasn't actually best for everyone, for, for some people overall. So, um, yeah, ultimately it comes down to your values. Um, I just think that targets are not the way to go, and I don't think Ofsted is going to help schools to improve, um, or the system to improve. Um, the sooner we abolish it, the better, that's what I say. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to both of you for a fascinating debate. Um, we are